Hello friends, welcome back to 3ABN Sabbath School panel. My name is Ryan Day. And as always, we wanna thank you, our 3ABN family, for joining us week after week as we've been making our way through this quarter's lesson entitled, In the Crucible with Christ. And wow, lesson number 12. It seems like it was just a couple of days ago that we started recording this, but uh, it's been 12 weeks. And so uh, it's a blessing to have my panel here, they make it easy to study with because each and every one of them are so intelligent and committed to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I, I just learn so much from each, each of you every week. So thank you so much for what you do. That being said, I guess we should introduce because we may have new viewers right now who don't know who in the world we are. Uh, so I'm going to start to my direct left, Pastor James Rafferty. Always good. a blessing to have you, brother. Good to be here, Ryan. I've got Monday's lesson, which is dying comes before knowing God's will. Amen. And of course, to your left is Miss Jill Morricone. Always a blessing to have you, sister. Thank you, my brother. I have Tuesday willingness to listen, which is a good lesson for me. <laughs> for us all, I suppose. And to your left is Miss Shelley Quinn. Am I not a bliss? Oh, you're a bliss. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> As you can see, we my, have fun on the panel. Go ahead. My you lesson, are a tremendous blessing. <laughs> <laughs> my lesson is self-reliance. Amen. Praise the Lord. And all the way down at the very end, Pastor John Denzi, just like Michelle Quinn, it's also a blessing to have you, brother. <laughs> well, it's a blessing for me to be here. It's a joy to participate in the Sabbath School panel. God is good. The title for Thursday is Substitutes. Substitutes. One word. One word. That's nice. It. Amen. Praise the Lord. Our memory text for this week is coming from John chapter 12, verse 24. And it says, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. It's amazing how Jesus could just use those simple analogies or those simple illustrations to really, really help us to understand the kingdom of God. So we have much to learn this week, but before we continue any further, may we go to the Lord in prayer. And Pastor John Denzi, I'm going to ask you if you'd pray for us. Sure, let's pray, pray together. Our loving Heavenly Father, we are grateful to you because of your great infinite mercy. Yes. We thank you so much, Lord, that as we experience trials and difficulties, we know we can rely upon you. Yes. And Lord, as we go through this lesson, we ask that you will bless us with your Holy Spirit. We pray that you will lead us in this study, teach us even as we share, mm -hmm. and guide us in a way that it will bring you honor and glory. Mm -hmm. We pray for everyone that will be listening. May your Holy Spirit touch their hearts to understand how they can also receive the mm -hmm. blessing of your presence and face trials looking unto Jesus. Mm -hmm. We ask you in Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen, amen, praise the Lord. Sabbath afternoon's lesson brings out that Jesus' picture of a kernel of wheat dying is a fascinating analogy of our submission to God's will. First, there is the falling. The kernel that falls from the wheat stalk has no control over where or how it falls to the ground. It has no control over the ground that surrounds and then presses over it. Mm. Second, there is the waiting. As the kernel lies in the earth, it does not know what the future holds. Mm. It cannot imagine what life will be like in the future, for it is only a kernel of wheat. Mm. And third, there's the dying. The kernel cannot possibly become a wheat stalk unless it gives up its safe, comfortable situation as a kernel. It must die. That is, it must give up what it has always been before so it may be transformed from a seed into a fruit-bearing plant. And on that note, we are no different. Mm -hmm. We, like that seed, must die to self. And Sunday's lesson is bringing that out very clearly. And Sunday's lesson is entitled Submission for Service. Mm -hmm. And it takes us to Philippians chapter 2. Mm -hmm. And I love the start of this because yes. Philippians 2 is one of my favorite chapters. It really highlights the gospel in a very, very special way. It helps us to get into the mind of Christ as we know that that's what most popularly that passage is known for. Mm -hmm. Of course, we're in Philippians chapter 2 and I'm going to read verses five through nine. Notice what the Bible says. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Mm -hmm. 
And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even to the death of the cross. Hmm. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every hmm. name. How precious is that name? Hmm. But, you know, it's amazing because in this woke I'm using that loosely. In this woke culture that we live in today, uh, we are often pressed to demand and assert our rights. And I certainly don't want to play down from that because uh, this is not necessarily bad in and of itself. We have rights and we should exercise those rights. Uh, but it's definitely interesting that on a spiritual Christian level, serving God often leads us to set aside those comfortable rights in order to follow the path of God's will for our life. That's good. That's the point of this whole lesson, submitting for a service, right? And of course, this sometimes uncomfortable path creates crucibles along the way. And I think each and every one of us can attest to that as we surrender to Jesus Christ. You know, you, you, often, you know, especially baby Christians, and I don't really want to use that. I don't like to be ref to refer to people as baby Christians, but I would say new believers, people who have just freshly surrendered their life to Jesus. The idea sometimes coming with that is that, oh, now that I've given my life over to the Creator, now that I've surrendered my life to my Savior, he, He's just going to protect me and nothing's ever going to happen and things are just going to be easy, easy going from there. But yet we know there's an enemy and we know that there's also a learning curve. Mm -hmm. There's also a path of now sanctification that we must take that's going to bring about a transformation in our life. And that includes dying. And so you'll notice that first Paul reminds us in that passage that we just read in Philippians chapter 2 that we must have the same mindset of Jesus. Let this mind be in you. So it's interesting that with this in that passage there there's three major points that we can break away or we can take away from that in order for us to understand if we're going to have the same mindset of Jesus well we have to look at what Jesus went through in order to uh, to become the Savior that He became so that He might pay for our sins. And so it's interesting the lesson brings out that Jesus gave up being equal with the Father and took the form of the limitation of a human mm. in order to save us. It's a powerful. He, he came from on high down here to become man. No other, no other religion on earth, all of the other pagan religions as man wanted to become God, mm. but in the Christian religion or the Christian faith, it's powerful because God, mm -hmm. the divine God, He becomes man. Uh, number two, Jesus did not show up as some champion human being, right? Like the Jews expected their Messiah to be, right? They were expecting Expecting, you know, the Messiah to show up and become this champion savior who's going to save them from the oppression of the Romans. Mm -hmm. And while Jesus did come to save them, not necessarily from the Romans, but from <laughs> sin, as the Bible says. And so, uh, you know, they, they expected their Messiah to show up to be this champion human, but rather Jesus came as a humble, lowly servant to other human beings. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, thirdly, it brings out, and of course, as a human servant, Jesus, the human servant, mm -hmm. he did not live a long and peaceful life but became obedient to death, as the scripture yeah. says. And his death was not even a noble, and it was not even an, in, in, basically carried out in a noble and respectful manner, mm. because as we know, according to Hebrews chapter 2, uh, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross and despised the shame. What can we learn from this? As it says, let this mind mm. be in you. Well, as Christ died to himself, we must also die to ourself. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, one of my favorite texts in yes. all of Scripture. If you, don't, if you don't know this text and you don't have it tucked away into the memory banks of your mind, mm -hmm. put it there, my friends, because this is a powerful text that brings about the reality of what must happen in order for us to prepare for the kingdom of God. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul writes, I have been crucified with Christ. Mm -hmm. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Mm -hmm. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So no longer, it's no longer me, it's no longer Ryan living, but now Ryan has to surrender his will to Jesus. You must surrender your will to Jesus. We all must surrender our will to Christ. And now it's him living through us. Even Jesus' words in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, which again is one of my favorite passages, but it brings about the reality of the price that we have to pay in order to have righteousness, in order to follow Christ. Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus says, it says, Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, 
Let him deny himself mm -hmm. and take up his cross daily and follow me. I've heard Christians all the time say, I'm a disciple of Jesus. I'm a <laughs> follower of Jesus. Well, Jesus, he puts it to the test. He says, well, if you follow me, then do you deny yourself? That's number one. We must deny ourselves. And then, of course, we have to take up our instrument of death. Mm. He says, I, Jesus, as Jesus died on the cross, we must also spiritually place self upon the altar, place self upon the cross and die daily so that we might follow him. Yeah. You know, we also see this beautiful imagery within the sanctuary uh, a path, the sanctuary um, uh, pattern that we're shown in the scripture because we know that God's gospel plan of salvation is put on very clearly on display there in the sanctuary model. And we see that the very first act that we must do and when we're coming in and we're progressing through the beautiful walk of sanctification, justification, sanctification in hopes to experience that glorification in the most holy place, we understand that it first begins with placing self upon the altar as the Lamb of God was also placed upon the altar. Mm -hmm. Romans chapter 6 Verses 1 through 4, powerful message here. Mm. Paul writes, what shall we say then? Mm. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who die to sin live any longer in it? Right? Mm. He says, I want you to die to sin. That is to die to self. But then notice verse 3 and onward. It says, or do you not know that as many as us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his yeah. death? Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Amen. Just like the seed dies, we must also die. Mm. John chapter 3, verse 30. I love the, the word, the simple words there. Very simple, short verse uh, uh, of the words of John the Baptist. He must increase and I mm. must decrease. Mm. Self mm. is leaving. I'd had to read this from Councils to the Church, page 80 in the time that I have left here. Powerful point here that really adds to what we're talking about. This is Councils to the Church, page 80. It says, The sin which is indulged to the greatest extent and which separates us from God and produces so many contagious spiritual disorders is selfishness. Mm. There can be no returning to the Lord except by self-denial. Of ourselves we can do nothing, but through God strengthening us we can live to do good to others yeah. and in this way shun the evil of selfishness. We need not to go to heathen lands to manifest our desire to devote all to God in a useful, unselfish life. We should do this in the home circle, mm -hmm. in the church, among those with whom we associate and with whom we do business. Right in the common walks of life is where self is to be denied and kept in subordination. Mm -hmm. Paul could say, I die daily. It is the daily dying to self in the little transactions of life that makes us overcomers. We should forget self in the desire to do good to others. Mm. We should forget self, excuse me, we should forget self in the desire to do good for others. Mm. With many there is a decided lack of love for others. Instead of faithfully performing their duty, they seek rather their own pleasure. My friends, let us not seek our own, but let us seek Jesus Christ and die to self today. Amen. Amen. Thank Amen. you, Ryan. The lesson I have for Monday picks up right where you're leaving off. Dying comes before knowing God's will. And the author directs us to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It, it begins, begins with this paragraph. Many Christians sincerely seek to know God's will for their lives. If only I could know God's will for my life, I would sacrifice everything for Him. But even after promising God this, we still may be confused about what His will is. Mm -hmm. what, what is God's will? How can we know yeah. God's will? The reason for this confusion may be found in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Paul is describing how we can know God's will. And he makes an important point. If you want to know what God's will is, you have to sacrifice first. Mm -hmm. Self has to die. We have to surrender ourselves to the Lord in order to know God's will. So let's read Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. It says... I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, mm -hmm. emphasis, mm -hmm. that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In other words, verse 2 is telling us we can know the will of God, right, as we surrender our lives to God and our lives are surrendered to God by His mercies. 
In other words, verse 1 is telling us that it's by the mercies of God that we actually make this surrender. It's beholding the mercies of God. In fact, in the context of this, chapter 11, because you know that word therefore implies what's gone before. Right. Mm -hmm. So look at verse uh, chapter 11, starting with verse 29. For the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. Whoo! Wait a minute. The <laughs> gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. Mm. God gives those gifts. He gives that calling, not expecting, excuse me, he wants repentance. Of course, he, he desires repentance, but he doesn't give it because we've repented. He gives it before we repent. It's the goodness of God, in other words, that leads us to repentance. So God's goodness comes to us before we repent in order that we will, will repent. Now, Paul is speaking about this in the context of the Jews who have rejected Christ. They've rejected the Messiah. And this is what he goes on to say. For as in times past, verse 30, have, excuse me, for ye in times past have not believed God, yet now have obtained mercy through their unbelief. Talking about the Jews, verse 31. Even so have these also not believed that through your mercy they may, may obtain mercy. Verse 32, for God has concluded them all under unbelief that he might have mercy upon them all. Oh, the depth of the riches of both the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. In other words, Paul is just flooding the mind and the heart here with this idea of God's mercy. Mm -hmm. God is so merciful. He's merciful to the Jews. He's actually taken them and put them in the category of unbelief so he can have mercy upon them, right? Yeah. And he's also been merciful to you. You were unbelievers, but now you're believing because of God's mercy towards you. It's just all about mercy, mercy, mercy. So I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, because God has been so merciful, I beseech you to surrender your lives to the the Lord, right, as a living sacrifice mm -hmm. so that you can know His will for you. This right. is how you know His will for you. The author goes on to, to explain this in three points. He says, first of all, we have a true understanding of God's mercy for us, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. When we have a true understanding of God's mercy for us, we offer ourselves, point two, as a living sacrifice to God and our minds, point three, are renewed. Mm. It is only the renewed mind that can truly understand God's will, the author goes on to say. But this renewal hinges on our death to self. And this death to self hinges on a clear and present view of God's mercies mm. toward us. Right. We see this in Titus, for example. Let's look in Titus chapter three and begin with verse one. It's powerful, really it is. Titus chapter three, beginning with verse one. Paul says, Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. He's talking about believers now. Mm -hmm. To speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. Verse 3, for we ourselves were also sometimes disobedient. We were deceived. We were serving diverse lusts, pleasures, living in malice, envy, hateful, and hating one another. But after that, the good kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us Amen. by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost which He shed upon us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Lord, that being justified by His grace we should be made heirs according to hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying and these things, the things that He just mentioned, I will that thou affirm constantly. Why? So that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. The only way we're going to surrender, the only way we're going to maintain good works is if we, if we continually remember God's mercies toward us. Mm -hmm. If we continually affirm those mercies toward us. Mm -hmm. This is the key that Paul is bringing out in Romans chapter 12. This is the emphasis that we find in this day's lesson from our author. He quotes Elizabeth Elliot, who writes, The surrender of our hearts, deepest longings, is perhaps as close as we come to understanding the cross. Mm -hmm. Our own experience of crucifixion, through, though immeasurably less than our Savior's, nonetheless furnishes us with a chance to begin to know Him in, a fel in fellowship with His sufferings. Mm -hmm. In every form our own of our own sufferings, He calls us into that fellowship. That's right. Elizabeth Elliot, Quest for Love. So when you think about this, it's really powerful, you know, because there's a statement that I've memorized 
kind of. I don't know if I completely remember it now in my older years, but it's from The Desire of Ages, pages 439 and 440, and it says this, when we see Jesus, a man of sorrows and acquainted with, with grief, when we see him traveling from city to city until his mission was accomplished, when we see him in Gethsemane sweating great drops of blood and on the cross dying in agony, when we see this, self will no longer clamor to be recognized. Mm. You see, self clamors to be recognized. Right. We want some recognition, we want just a little bit of glory, just a little bit of, well, when we see Jesus, right. self will no longer clamor to be recognized. And then it goes on to say this, we will be willing to be anything or nothing. Wow. Okay, the anything part, I'm all in for that. I'll, anything, God, <laughs> anything you want me, but the nothing part, the nothing, right. <laughs> Anything or nothing? Right. Like nothing? Really? Nothing? <laughs> so that we may do heart service for the master. Wow. That's powerful. The key, the key, according to Romans chapter 12, is to see the mercies of God, is to recognize the mercies of God. And when we recognize, when we see, and not just see and recognize, but focus on them. So discovering God's will for our lives is the most important task given to us. The devil will oppose this task in every way possible, the author says. Bottom line of the trial we face and do face is to overcome evil with good. Mm -hmm. So that's what Romans 12, 21 calls us to do. And that can only take place with a full surrender. And that full surrender can mm -hmm. only take place when we behold, when we focus on, when we over and over again uh, center in God's mercy, God's love for us. Mm -hmm. And that love for us crucifies self. So God's purpose for us is more stable than any future uh, that any man can offer us. I mean, we look at the world today, right? Look at the world today. Mm -hmm. uh, it's most advanced level of knowledge and, and, and all of the riches and the wealth. And we realize that it is, it's uncertain. Yeah. Our future is uncertain. Everything the world has to offer us is uncertain. What, what, what today is uncertain. Tomorrow, we don't know what's going to happen. Right. A year ago, two years ago, you know, things get turned upside down. Why is this? Well, I think the reason why this is, is because man is completely untrustworthy when it comes to our lives. Mm. Why? Because we are selfish. Inherently, we are selfish. We really don't have other people's interests at heart, but God loves us. Mm -hmm. God is unselfish. God always has our interests at heart. Right. And so surrendering our will to a God who's always thinking about us versus doing our own thing and doing what the world wants us to do, if we think about this, just analyze it, just look at the big picture. You know, the middle verse of the Bible with equal verses to the left and equal verses to the right is Psalm 118, verse 8. Okay. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Amen. And it's yeah. interesting how providential yeah. that must have been to get that verse right there. But that's the central point that Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 12. Okay. That's the point of understanding God's will. When we recognize it's better to trust in the Lord, mm -hmm. like no matter what it looks like, he's at the other centered, the cross, the love of God, the sacrifice in Philippians of Jesus Christ shows us that God is other centered. So whatever his will is for us, it's gotta be better than what man has because man is not about us. Man is not interested in us. I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Amen. Holy, acceptable unto God. That's your reasonable service. Why? Because God loves you with an other centered love. He's only got your best interest at heart and man doesn't. It's your reasonable service so that you may know what is the good and acceptable will of God. Hey. Wow, powerful lesson, my brother. Thank you so much, appreciate that. Well, this engine's just getting warmed up. <laughs> We've got so much more to go. Don't go anywhere, we're gonna take a short break. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 Avian Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3AVNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Hello, friends. Welcome back to 3ABN Sabbath School Panel. We're going to kick it over to Ms. Jill Morconi for Tuesday's lesson. Thank you so much, Pastor Ryan and Pastor James. This is an incredible lesson, mm -hmm. Dying Like a Seed, mm -hmm. understanding that submission and that surrender, death to self. I'm Jill Morricone. On Tuesday's lesson, we have willingness to listen. 
which is another indication of that death to self. Mm. Let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 2. We're going to spend our time in 1 Samuel 2 and 1 Samuel 3. Now, of course, 1 Samuel 3 is Samuel, his call to prophetic ministry, you could say, when he first heard the voice of God. Um, but 1 Samuel 2 is not such a pretty story, some of it. The lesson contrasted the willingness to listen versus those individuals who didn't want to listen mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and what the result of lack of listening, what that leads to. We really study three characters this week. We study Eli's sons, his wicked sons, Hophni and Phinehas. They were corrupt, were they not? Mm -hmm. Worldly, rebellious, mm -hmm. impure disrespectful to their father and God. It reminds me of that list of sins in 2 Timothy 3, where men are lovers of their own selves, yeah. and boastful, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. That's really a description mm. of Eli's sons. Mm. Then we see Eli himself. Now, Eli clearly knew what was right. He even wanted to do right. Mm. He even wished things could be different. Mm but he lacked the will to act. Mm. And he kind of settled for events to play out with terrible consequences. Mm. He reminds me of Jesus' prayer to the disciples there in Gethsemane. Mm. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Mm. By contrast, we look at Samuel. He knew what was right and he did what was right. Mm. His character stood in marked contrast to that of Eli's sons. Mm. He was a child of promise, but he was a child of integrity. He lived surrounded by evil, surrounded by disobedience, degradation, and yet he was pure of heart and character before God. So we're going to contrast, as we go through this section, we're going to contrast the wicked sons of Eli and their inability to listen or their lack of listening and what that led to. And then we're going to look at Samuel mm. and how he listened and what that leads to. Mm. So we're in 1 Samuel 2, verse 12. We're starting with the wicked sons of Eli. 1 Samuel 2, 12. Now the sons of Eli were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. The NIV says this, Eli's sons were scoundrels. Mm -hmm. They had no regard for the Lord. So takeaway number one, lack of listening leads to lack of knowledge of God. Mm -hmm. You notice that they were corrupt. They were scoundrels. They were disobedient. What happened? They did not know mm -hmm. the Lord. Mm -hmm. If we don't listen to God, we're not going to know him. Mm -hmm. If we don't listen to him, we're not going mm -hmm. to understand him. Mm -hmm. Lack of listening leads to a lack of knowledge of God. Mm -hmm. Let's keep going. Verses 13 through 16, we won't read it. But the priests in Israel were entitled to a portion of the animal offering. Mm. But it was only after the fat had been burned away mm -hmm. as a sacrifice mm -hmm. to the Lord. And yet Hophni and Phinehas said, we're not going to do it God's way. We're not going to wait for the fat to be burned. They showed contempt for God mm. and contempt for his law. Mm. Takeaway number two, lack of listening, it leads to disobedience. Not only lack of knowledge of God, you can see the progression of sin. It leads to disobedience. They did their own thing, regardless of the law of God. Verse 16, let's read uh, 1 Samuel 2, verse 16. Now this, it says, if the man, now this is the worshiper, the one bringing their offering. If they said to him, now this is Eli, um, Eli's son's servant, so they would receive the offering. If the worshiper said to him, they should really burn the fat first. In other words, they're reminding him, this is the law. This is what you're supposed to be doing. They should burn the fat first. Then you may take as much as your heart desires. He would answer them, no, you must give it now. And if not, I will take it by force. Mm. Takeaway number three, lack of listening, it leads to force. Wow. Mm. James chapter one, verse 19, we are supposed to be swift to hear, mm. slow to speak, slow to wrath. Mm. Let's read verse 17. Therefore the sin of the young men, this is Eli's sons, was very great before the Lord. For men abhorred the offering of the Lord. Mm. Takeaway number four, 
lack of listening becomes a stumbling block for other people mm -hmm. and their walk with God. Mm -hmm. So they didn't just hurt themselves. They didn't just push themselves away from God. They didn't just walk in disobedience themselves. Mm -hmm. They didn't just force other people. They actually became a stumbling block mm -hmm. to other people who sought to follow God. Now let's look at the flip side. We begin to look at Samuel. 1 Samuel 2.18, but Samuel ministered before the Lord. I love how it starts with but. It's the contrast mm -hmm. here between the sons of Eli and Samuel. Samuel ministered before the Lord, even as a child, wearing a linen ephod. Takeaway number five, learning to listen. Now this is a positive. Mm -hmm. Learning to listen leads to purity and obedience. Mm -hmm. Samuel's moral ascent is contrasted with the moral descent of the sons of Eli. Mm -hmm. In the same sanctuary where an obedient person prospered, that was Samuel, the proud and the arrogant, they were condemned. Mm. And we can see that. Let's read verse 21, the second half of verse 21. Meanwhile, the child Samuel grew before the Lord. Takeaway number six, learning to listen, it leads to spiritual growth. Mm -hmm. It's an incredible contrast between him growing in grace and growing in the knowledge of God, growing in character development and them degrading. Now we see more degradation take place in the next verse, verse 22. This is Eli's sons. Eli was very old and he heard everything his sons did to all Israel and how they lay with the woman who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Mm -hmm. The tent of meeting, this is the place between a holy God and his people became defiled by the corrupt priests um, wow. forcing themselves, you could say, mm -hmm. on the women who were there. Takeaway number six, lack of listening leads to pain and suffering in people around us because they refused to listen. Mm -hmm. Other people suffered mm -hmm. the consequences of their choices. Eli rebuked his sons, but he didn't remove them from office and mm -hmm. he ought to have. The boys should have died for what they did. And yet their father only said, please change, please change, please change. And that was all that ever happened. Verse 25, jump down to verse 25, second half. They did not heed the voice of their father. He pleaded with them, but they didn't heed because the Lord desired to kill them. Takeaway number eight, lack of listening, it can lead to death. Serious consequences mm. when we do not listen to God. Let's jump down to 1 Samuel 3. Now we're transitioning again. This is when Samuel hears, remember he goes to bed and he hears a voice, Samuel, mm. Samuel, and he runs to Eli and he says, you called me. I didn't, son, go back and lie down. And then he goes just to bed and he hears a voice again. Three times mm. God calls to Samuel. We're in 1 Samuel 3 verse 10. This is the third time. The Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel, and Samuel said, speak mm. for your servant hears. Mm. Takeaway number nine, learning to listen begins with asking God to speak to you. Mm. Have you asked God to speak to you? Mm. Wow. I don't think I've asked enough. Mm -hmm. Have you gone before God and said, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Mm -hmm. Would you instruct me? Would you teach me? I want to learn. And then what Samuel heard was a judgment against the house of Eli, and he didn't want to hear that. Mm -hmm. It's first prophetic revelation. That's your child. That's not what you want to hear. And it says in verse 15, Samuel lay down to morning, opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and he was afraid to tell Eli the mm. vision. We jump down to verse 18. Samuel told Eli everything and hid nothing from him. And Eli said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Mm. Take away number 10, learning to listen. It involves courage mm -hmm. and faith. Mm. It's not always easy to listen to God. Mm -hmm. And it's not always easy to walk in obedience when God speaks to you. But the results are worth it. So let's look at those takeaways real quick. Lack of listening, it leads to lack of knowledge of God, disobedience, force, you becoming a stumbling block for other people, pain and suffering in those around you. It can even lead to death. But learning to listen mm. leads to purity and obedience, to spiritual growth. It begins with asking God to teach you and to speak to you. Mm. And it involves courage and faith. I don't know about you, but I want to learn to listen. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Ooh, I love that lesson, Jill. Thank you. I'm Shelley Quinn. I have Wednesdays and the title is simply Self-Reliance. So this young prophet Samuel, he grows in the Lord and now God has him anoint Saul as a king. And what our lesson is really about today mm -hmm. is the three steps to Saul's downfall, mm. and it's all because of self-reliance. Mm. But let me give you a little history before we get in this. In 1 Samuel 10, verse 8, Samuel the prophet specifically instructed Saul the king in this way. 1 Samuel 10, 8, you shall go down before me to Gilgal. This is the site of Israel's base camp mm. during the days of the conquest. He said, and surely, I will come down to you, Saul, to offer burnt offerings and make sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait till I come to you and show you what you should do. So Saul the king's got these instructions, but if you turn to 1 Samuel 13, I'm just going to kind of summarize what happened. I really, this was an interesting history lesson for me. I really went back to study this. In 1 Samuel 13, 1 through 9, what's happening? They're expecting the Ammonites mm. to retaliate for Saul's victory mm -hmm. at Jabesh Gilead. So Saul chooses an elite guard of 3,000 soldiers and then he sends the rest of the men back to their tents. He posts his son, Jonathan, with a third of the men, a thousand of the men went with Jonathan to Gibeah, Gibeah, Gibeah. Gibeah. And then Saul and the other 2,000, they are guarding the approach to Bethel and Gibeah from the east. So right now they're at peace with the Philistines. They weren't expecting the Philistines to do anything, but what happened? The Philistines had this outpost, this guard post at Geba, G-E-B-A, do you say Geba, Geba? Whatever this town was. <laughs> and, and this outpost posted a threat mm. to Israel's kingdom. So what does Jonathan do? He's there with a thousand men and he says, I'm gonna take care of this threat. So he attacks the garrison that the Philistines had. He defeats them. Now the Philistines mobilize a counterattack and they've got thousands of horsemen and thousands of chariots. So King Saul is realizing what's going on. He blows the horn and, and he's blowing on that ram's horn saying, hey, there's going to be a greater battle. Come back for the rest of the army. Mm. And then he departs their staging area in Michmash. He retreats to Gilgal leaving the Philistines in control of the central plateau. Mm. So this is really a serious situation. And the Israelites become panic stricken. Their morale is deteriorating. Guess what? They, they forgot the victory mm -hmm. at Jabesh. They go from faith to fright. Mm -hmm. And now they start to scatter. Wow. They're, defeat, they're, they're actually deserting their post and they leave Saul with no more than 600 men mm. at Gilgal. So what happens to Saul? He's watching his dwindling resources. He panics and he forgets that Gideon's army went from 32,000 to just 300. Mm. And with the Lord's blessing, with just 600 men mm. left, he could have been victorious. But to him, this is a crisis situation. Mm. He becomes impatient. He's supposed to be waiting seven days at Gilgal. He's waiting and he's waiting and six days pass and all of a sudden he's impatient mm. and he doesn't wait for the mm. prophet mm. to come yeah. and offer the, the sacrifice, give advice for the battle. Mm. It's possibly the early part of the seventh day. He presumptuously assumes the responsibility and the king Saul goes out and offers the sacrifices and no sooner than he does this, on the horizon, here comes the prophet Samuel. <laughs> so. Saul failed the test of his character. Yeah. Mm. That's all there is to it. He directly disobeyed God's command given to him by the prophet. So now let's pick up. We're ready to go for it. Yeah. First Samuel 13, 11. Samuel arrives and he says to Saul, 
What have you done? Mm -hmm. Now, you know what? That question mm -hmm. really opened the door for confession and repentance. Amen. But yeah. listen to what Saul said. There's going to be three steps in here. Mm -hmm. Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattered from me and that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines gathered together at Michmash. Let's hit the pause button. Mm. Mm. That first step of his downfall, Paul, or Saul says, I saw mm. the pressure of the situation, mm -hmm. the troops scattering. Mm -hmm. and, and he is looking, you know, Samuel's absence. Mm -hmm. He looks around at the circumstances and through human evaluation, mm -hmm. he decides, uh-oh, we got to do something fast. He failed to trust the Lord. Now, it's interesting to me, he did not deny understanding God's instructions, but what he's doing, watch him. He's going to do some blame shifting and justifying. Mm -hmm. And then verse 12, so he said, I saw, verse 12, then I said, mm -hmm. the Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal and I've not made supplication to the Lord. He, this is the second step. I said, what he saw with his eyes shaped what he was thinking and he spoke not in the spirit of faith. And then it continues in verse 12. Therefore, I felt compelled. Mm. Mm. I felt compelled mm. and I offered a burnt offering. Mm. So the third step I saw, I said, mm. now human thinking leads mm -hmm. to this human emotion. I felt and mm -hmm. his actions are misguided. Mm. He disobeys the Lord. Presumption, presum presumption mm -hmm. led him to panic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I got to repeat that because mm -hmm. some of us need to remember this. Presumption mm -hmm. can lead mm -hmm. to panic mm. and wrong actions. Right. God's favor is on obedience, mm -hmm. not on sacrifice, not on doing anything else. So 1 Samuel 13, verse 13, Samuel the prophet now says to King Saul, you have done foolishly. Yeah. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom shall not continue. Mm. God can't trust you to be in, in control of this kingdom. Mm. The Lord has sought for himself a man after his own heart. He's talking about David. And the Lord has commanded him to be commander over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Mm -hmm. Wow, three steps. I saw, I said, I felt mm -hmm. compelled to take an action against God's word. Mm -hmm. Now, let's look. I've got eight takeaways. To me, this was an amazing lesson. Number one. Character is not forged in crisis. Mm. It's forged through the daily depending mm -hmm. upon God. It's revealed mm -hmm. in the crucible, not yes. forged in the crucible. Mm -hmm. Number two, look to God in times of crisis. If we look at our shrinking resources, mm -hmm. we're going to be just like Saul. We're going to panic. Number three, presumption is prideful. We think, we presume Samuel thought he knew more than God who sees the end from the beginning. Mm -hmm. Same thing for us. Number four, don't be impatient with God's timing. Don't take <coughs> matters into your own hands mm -hmm. to accomplish your goal. Mm -hmm. Number five, don't disobey by doing what you think is a good thing that actually goes against God's commandments. Mm -hmm. yeah. Number six, remember God looks for faith, not rituals. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that sacrifice. It was waiting for advice from the prophet that Samuel should have done. Mm -hmm. Number seven, 
Don't make excuses to justify your mistakes. Don't practice blame shifting and uh, putting it off on somebody else. Just repent. And number eight, humility is total dependence upon God. We need to emulate the submission of Jesus. Amen. 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 Taking up uh, the Thursday's lesson, Substitutes. My name is John Dinsey. And this part of the lesson brings to us, to our attention, the fact that sometimes we try to find a substitute for God, a substitute for trusting in God, and try to do things our way by relying upon something else. The lesson brings out that some people, when they feel depressed, well, I'm going shopping instead of depending on the Lord to get this uh, depression out of my mind or some other activity. And some people, they say they pursue fame. Mm. And they also mentions that in the lesson that some people, when they're having some issues with their spouse, they think, well, uh, I'm going to go for somebody else. Mm. So this, of course, brings bad results. And many of the things we can use to relieve pressure are nothing but distractions. I'm going to call distractions of the devil. The devil is uh, mm -hmm. clever. You know, he's had practice for a few thousand years and he knows how to deceive us. And I remember, I remember very well uh, that, uh, as, as has been said in the past, that the devil doesn't care what part of the boat you fall out of. That's right. As long as you fall out. So he <laughs> right. can, he can try to deceive you in whatever direction as long as you fa fall out. The lesson brings out also three possible substitutes that people use. There, are, there could be more. Using human logic or past experience that I did it my way before, mm. when we need a fresh divine revelation. Blocking problems from our minds when we need divine solutions. I remember as we were doing in gathering, I don't know if the, uh, mm -hmm. this is still done in some places, but mm -hmm. we were young and we we're doing in gathering mm -hmm. and we were going from place to place and there was uh, this man that we approached and um, he, as we talked to him, he began to weep. He was drunk. Mm. He began to weep and uh, we prayed for him. And he gave us his name, you know, and his uh, address. We visited him. And eventually he told us that he was having so many problems that alcohol was mm. his way out, his mm. way of coping mm -hmm. with the thing. Yeah. But he really needed the Lord in his life. Amen. And by God's grace, we had the opportunity to lead him in the path that brought him the peace and hope through Jesus Christ. Uh, the third thing we have here is escaping reality and avoiding God when we need communion with God for divine power. And I love that the lesson brought out uh, in Zechariah, it says here, Zechariah, Zechariah helps us to focus on what really matters when we are tempted to use substitutes. Mm -hmm. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6. Listen, this is powerful. It says there, so he answered and said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, mm -hmm. not by might, mm -hmm. nor by power, yes. but by my spirit, mm -hmm says the Lord of hosts. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yes, today that is so true. Today there is no other way. You can try some other way, <laughs> but you're going to fail. You're going to suffer unnecessarily, by the way, when God can be your strength. Yes. So not by power, not by might. Not, when you talk about might, you're talking about strength, and you're even talking about human intellect because mm -hmm. people appeal mm -hmm. to other uh, human beings. Hey, what do you think about this? <laughs> Help me out with this. And yes, uh, there is safety in the multitude of counselors, mm -hmm. but in the, in the final results, we need to always measure all things that we hear from other people by the word of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And you have many experiences about that in the Bible. And I'm remembering um, the son of Solomon. When there was an issue in Israel, they said, hey, uh, you know, now that your father's gone, could you, could you kind of lighten the burden that we have? Mm. Uh, it's been tough on us. And so he consulted with uh, the uh, elderly and they said, yes, you should lighten the burden. But then he consulted with the young people. Oh, no, mm. make it harder for them. Make it harder for them. And he did. And, of course, the people suffered. So we need to... Uh, look at the scriptures, look to the Lord, because it's not by power, not by might, but by the Spirit of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go to a, a hymn mm. uh, that I heard many years ago. Mm. I, I think some of you may know it. 
No one understands like Jesus. Mm. I'm just going to read a few words here. It says, no one understands like Jesus. Mm. He's a friend beyond compare. Meet him at the throne of mercy. Yes. He is waiting for you there. No one understands like Jesus. When the days are dark mm -hmm. and grim, mm -hmm. no one is so near, so dear yes. as Jesus. Cast your every care mm -hmm. on him. No one understands like Jesus. Every woe he sees and feels. Tenderly, he whispers comfort and the broken heart he heals. Mm -hmm. And that is what is waiting for you. Hope in Jesus. Go to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the best answer. The situation you're going through, you have suffered already long mm. enough. Why not do it God's way? Mm. Continue to trust in the Lord. Mm -hmm. Wait on the Lord. You know, we had a previous mm. lesson where we were talking about waiting on the Lord. Mm. Waiting can be difficult sometimes, mm. yeah. but oh, the yeah. blessing mm. of <laughs> seeing how God works it out, oh, the joy mm. and the yeah. looking back and you say, Mm. I'm glad mm. we waited Amen. because God brought you the best answer. And if you try your way, you're going to fail. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes in the desperation, people do things that brings upon them great harm. Mm. So if you're experiencing desperation and you're at the point of, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Continue to trust in the Lord. I remember a lady that called here uh, many years ago and she said, Pray for us. Uh, if we don't pay the rent tomorrow, they're going to throw us out. Mm. And uh, we don't know what we're going to do. My daughter doesn't have a job. I can't work. Pray for us. So we had prayer and praise the Lord. I had the opportunity uh, to answer the phone when she <laughs> called about three weeks later. And she said, oh, I recognize your voice. Let, let me tell you what happened. I was wondering what happened. Let me tell you what happened. The next day in the mail, we got some money. We had no idea where it came from, but we were able to pay the rent and it helped us for a couple of weeks. My daughter has a job. It's a part-time job, mm -hmm. but she has a job that may turn into a full-time job. God has the answer. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. it appeared to be at the very last moment. Sometimes God waits for the very last <laughs> moment. But God brought the answer. Don't look for substitutes. Trust in the Lord, not by power, mm. not by might, by, by my spirit, says the Lord. During the days of Elijah, the people tried to substitute God by idols. They were worshiping idols. Mm. And there was this great uh, a showdown, let's say, and God, if God be God, then worship him. And, and oh, you got to read that story. It's powerful. <laughs> it's powerful. So uh, I want to tell you also about the danger. It's still out there. You know, I remember many years ago, there was uh, these psychic hotlines that were out there. And they were announcing, announcing these 900 numbers. And when you call these 900 numbers, you were paying $3, $5 or more per minute as you were talking to these so-called psychics that were not of the Lord. Mm. I remember a lady mm. that was below us while we were there uh, doing a job for three men in Puerto Rico and her husband left her. She began to call these psychic hotlines and uh, trying to find an answer through that and she was just adding suffering upon suffering. Mm. The answer is in Jesus. Amen. He is a friend beyond compare. God is our refuge and strength and he will be with us in the time of trouble. I'm remembering, uh, I'm going to call him uh, Robert. He was uh, a young man about my age when I was younger. When I was younger, he's still, <laughs> he's still about my age, by the way. <laughs> but anyway, he was a young man that was dedicated. He was uh, doing missionary work. Something happened in his life, and he left the Lord. Mm. And I always wonder what happened to this young man. He was so, so vibrant, so, so strong in the Lord. Mm. And he... For many years, I did not see him. I mean, I think it's like 10 or more years passed. And one day I'm passing by that church. I was already working at 3 Event. I'm passing by that church in Chicago. Mm. And I saw him out there sitting, uh, standing outside the church, just looking at the church. The church was closed, but he's just there looking at the church. I said, uh, Robert, what are you doing here? I don't know. I'm just remembering the days when I used to worship here. Mm. And uh, he just looked so different. He just, mm. he looked like he was not with the Lord. I said, well, how are you doing? He says, oh, I'm facing some tough times. Mm. So anyway, we, we talked for a moment, left, didn't see him for another three years. Mm. And I'm happy to report where I saw him. 
at an evangelistic campaign. Mm. And I said, Robert, he was dressed in a suit. He had his hair nicely combed. And he says, Johnny, good to see you again. Mm. And I said, uh, good to see you and you're here. He says, yes, yes. Mm. I came back to the Lord, mm. 18 years away from the Lord. They were horrible years. And mm. I said, praise the Lord. Why? Because he realized that without the Lord, he just had horrible, horrible time. Depend on the Lord, trust in him. He will help you. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Thank you guys so much. All right. We have, let's get some final thoughts. Well, the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 49, verses 14 to 16, can a woman forsake her child that she may not have compassion on the son of whom? And they may. The Bible says that our own parents may forsake us, that God loves us beyond the love of a mother for a son. And sometimes we have a conflict, you know, in doing God's will, there's a conflict with what our parents want us to do or what our friends want us to do, or what the world wants us to do. We just need to remember that God's love for us is greater than any earthly human mm -hmm. love. We surrender to Him. He'll direct us. He'll direct our paths. Amen. Amen. I, as we think about learning to listen, I'm reminded of Isaiah 30. Your ears will hear a word behind you saying, mm -hmm. this is the way. Walk ye in it. Do you need mm -hmm. direction? Do you need hope? Do you need deliverance? Learn to listen to Jesus. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. And just remember the three steps of downfall for Saul. I saw I said, I felt, mm -hmm. when you're looking at something, don't look at the circumstances, look to God. Amen. Don't speak in a way that is not in the spirit of faith and don't let your feelings compel you to do actions of self-reliance. Mm -hmm. Amen, amen. I have a message for you from the Lord in Psalm 50, 15. Call upon me in the day of trouble, mm -hmm. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. Call upon the Lord, trust in Him with all of your heart. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Thank you guys so much. We need to learn to die like a seed. Mm. That's what I've <laughs> learned today. And uh, in dying like a seed, that means adopting the mind of Christ. First John chapter 4, verse 8 tells us about that mind. God is love. And 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8, powerful. It says, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is mm. not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked, thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And the first part of verse 8, love never fails. Mm. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. My friends, it's been a blessing to have you studying with us this week. You're not going to want to miss next week. Lesson number 13, last one in this quarter. Mm. Of course, it's entitled Christ in the Crucible. Mm. God bless you all, and we'll see you right back here next week.